will come to order. Uh, just quickly, I think today we have council with us for the next hour and then potentially roughly from 11 to 12. Um, so I think we'll try to make good use of Michael now. Then we can probably have some discussion amongst ourselves without him. Um, looks like Nolan will be with us. Nolan, do you have for the next hour and then so much? Oh. Linda, you're you're now. Uh, we can hear ourselves in. <laughs> Sorry. Settling. That's okay. Um, Nolan, do, what what's your schedule this morning? Do we have you? Yeah, you have me for as long as you want me. Okay, thank you. Um, we also are uh, at eleven. I I gather the governor uh, will announce his one of or the first of his. Uh, economic stimulus bills that will include a significant ag um, portion piece of it. And what we understand is that is in many ways based on the beginning of our bill, at least the dairy section. So um, that suggests to me uh, that, you know, we have a little bit of time. We are going to have support for at least some of the concepts we've been talking about. Uh, and I know that uh, Bobby, um, who will be back with us Friday, and we're hoping we can then hear directly from the agency. Um, does that make sense? Just to, to yes. any questions about that? Okay. So um, we would plan to have Anson in with us on Friday? That's the hope. I don't know, you know, Bobby was going to reach out. Um, oh, he was, okay. To see, yeah. I, he, they, as, as you may have heard from others on the all Senate call, they got some people got a bit of a preview last night. Um, yeah. And Bobby had a long chat with Anson apparently. And they, they commented that a lot of our discussion informed what they were doing in terms of the tiers of dairy and things like that. Um, Senator Hardy, did you have? Oh, no, I just, I, want... I just spoke with Bobby this morning and that's what he said. And I also, I urged, uh, or I reached out to Abby Willard and Ellen Kaler, Abby from the agency and Ellen from Sustainable Jobs Farm to Plate and got a list of things. I asked them for their sort of priority list based on the strategic, the ag strategic plan that we all got at the beginning of the session. So I sent that to you. I just got it last night. So I sent it to you last night. I haven't fully digested it, but it overlaps a lot, which is helpful um, and uh, is more of the sort of sector-wide type stuff that we were trying to hone in on um, beyond just direct payments to farmers. So um, we can talk about that if you want, Chris, but it's in your email boxes this morning. Okay. Well, and I think uh, over the weekend, the news reports, I don't know, Anthony, if, if you had the chance to get down to the Berlin food drop. Like it was. No, I, I didn't. I, Debbie I and checked it out. It was pretty amazing. Yeah. You know, thousands of people, thousands of cars, which means more than thousands of people. And then There's a bunch one today in my neighborhood, around yeah. the corner from where I live in Middlebury. So say that again, Ruth. There's one, there's a food, uh, the, the same kind of food distribution thing today in Middlebury, right around the corner, basically from where I live. So if I have a chance, I might run over there. But yeah, I think there's a huge need for people to have to get food. And I'd love to be able to address that in our larger package. Nine, the Times Argus said 1,900 cars. Yeah, and they turned a lot of people away. There just wasn't enough food. So, you know, that speaks to food security. Um, I mean, I don't want to gloss over it. It's horrifying. It's very scary. And it and it and I've become more and more convinced that the next few months are going to be very revealing and we're going to see a lot of the pain and the weakness of even the response to date. Um, so it does, food is central and, and I think it, it should spur us on. Um, if the administration, as I understand it, is only looking at dairy, I think, you know, speaking for myself, I, I want us to push more broadly as we've been discussing. Yeah. We also did get an email not much in it, but from Betsy Rosenbluth, Rosenbluth, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I'm mm -hmm. saying it right, from Feed and 
the school network, National Farm School Network, et cetera, saying they want to talk with us about hunger issues and food issues. Um, they, they work with the Food Bank and Hunger Free Vermont and NOFA and others. And they're trying to put together an approach to ending, not ending hunger, but dealing with the hunger issues. I expect we would have them in. And I also think, um, Senator Hardy, have you guys been tracing the food, food school foods? Um, there had been some discussion about continuing the service they've been doing in, in Senate education. Have you been talking about that? Well, yeah. I mean, the last time I, I asked the Secretary of Education about whether or not the, the, so they had asked for a waiver the, for this summer to allow right. them to continue to deliver food like they have been doing. And the last I heard, they hadn't heard back from that waiver. I can check in with with Rosie, but the feds are for some reason being a little difficult on approving a waiver to allow school food to continue to be delivered the way it has been. There's still the summer lunch program, um, but that is more of a sort of pickup congregate setting kind of situation. So I don't know the, the, the latest status, but I can, I can find that out. Um, yeah, please do look into it because I think, you know, it, it's all part of the same parcel. And it seems to me, even without a waiver, that would be potentially eligible for COVID money. I mean, it, it is a reaction to food security and to economic impact of COVID. Mm -hmm. I think um, it depends on whether or not we can get the school districts to do it. We would have to fund it sufficiently to... Right pay for the staff, food, and transportation. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so, yeah, just go ahead. One more piece. Uh, Michael and I have been working on it, and Nolan, a new uh, approach to the migrant farm workers uh, piece that we hope will be uh, eligible or allowable to <laughs> work for doing uh, using federal funding um, so that we can put it into the larger package and not have to rely on general funds for that. Um, so Michael is working on a, an updated draft after I sent him comments last night. Michael, I, I sent you, I sent you the updates, I don't know, like three minutes ago. Oh yeah, you did. Wow. Um, that was magic. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't know if you want wanted them to go to Linda. Um, I, I don't know. I defer to Chris. I don't know exactly what our goal is for this meeting. If we're doing this stuff or are we doing the mis miscellaneous? No, let, let's uh, hold. Th this to me is the priority. The miscellaneous ag we're going to have to come to. And so if we run out of steam on things we want to explore um, as we wait for the administration on this bill, then we can shift to missing ag and Michael's ready to walk us through that. But let's start with the relief bill. Um, and uh, Michael, are there other updates in terms of language? Um, to me, I, I have not, I'll confess, not been as honed in on the language and still thinking of it conceptually, but um, besides the, <clears throat> the uh, idea of helping migrant workers, are there other changes, uh, Sarah Kalama? Thank you. I, I just wanted to suggest maybe it would make sense to wait until we see what the administration's proposal is specifically uh, before we take up our bill again. In other words, I think there's gonna be some substantial overlap and I, I don't know that it makes a lot of sense to make changes to what we've already drafted and then listen to what they have and then we're gonna to have to go back and do it all over again. It's just a thought. And I know it's at 11 o'clock today. Um, unfortunately, we always are meeting at the same time that the governor is doing the press conference. So I've never been able to actually watch the press conference, not suggesting that today, but you see where I'm coming from? Rather than sort of work on something and then have the other piece, which I think will be a bill, I believe it'll start in, I mean, it'll be a committee bill not here, but it will follow the committee process from what I was told yesterday and, and eventually wind up in appropriation. So um, there just may be some duplicative work done before we listen to what they have. Kind of. 
Yeah, Senator Hardy. Brian, uh, Brian, do you know, I mean, will it, is it going to come to us? You said it's going to start in commerce, but it, are they going to, you know, section off? I mean, I guess <laughs> you don't know, but <laughs> do you think we're going to get the section that's on uh, for ag that, so we, we get to work on that, not commerce? Because we've already. Yeah, I, I don't think the path forward is 100% clear right now. Uh -huh. um, but I assume that if it has something to do with agriculture, this committee would have some something to say about that and the rest of it with other businesses might go to economic development um but i think in the end it'll be uh it'll be a bill that a couple of committees will look at so i don't know what okay. how it well, i think ryan's point is uh, is a good one in terms of fussing about language i do think that you know it's a proposal that you're going to they're introducing draft one, we will enact draft six. So um, to me, it still makes sense to cover concepts that we're interested in, and then we'll have the chance to weigh whether or not we think it's realistic, get feedback on what we're trying to add. If, if as I understand it, it is pretty narrowly tailored to dairy. That um, is heavy influence uh, yeah but i think the breakdowns in terms of the size of farms uh was similar to what we had done in our bill that's um, my understanding yeah and the appropriation i think is is much greater to be honest about it but i don't know yet because i where i was yesterday anson wasn't there so we didn't actually unpack anything having to do with the agriculture part it was uh, more of a overview of how much money total uh would be talked about today so i, oh, I see well, your point too Chris. what i think makes sense is let's have michael talk about the details that he and senator hardy have come up with if that makes sense do you think you're yeah. ready for that senator hardy sure uh, you mean the migrant farm yeah. worker part of it yeah yeah michael and do you want to send it to everybody send it to us and and, and linda how have we done this in terms of what we post? Have we typically had the draft up on the website so people can follow? Yes, as Michael is going through it. Okay. Um, so let's continue with that practice so people watching can follow. We'll, we'll walk through um, what Senator Hardy and, and Michael have worked on. Then I think it would, I'd benefit from just conceptually um putting things on the on the list you know we, we should sort of review let's call it the sections in terms of of what we're trying to do you know we talked about last week um some of the stuff that ella and the the uh the business planning um <clears throat> dynamic you know we we talked about um what, what there was another existing program we we referenced last week you know that that i think I, the way i think of it is things that we would like to potentially include that would bolster yeah, oh we talked about working lands that was another one you know giving them a a, a a special grant that is directly sort of food security emergency response whatever um so things like that that um we would like to consider for this uh, before we get there. Does that make sense for our morning? Sure. Yep. All right, Michael, why don't you get started? It, it's being posted online, so if people are watching, it may take a moment. That will show up on a Senate Ag website. Um, but go ahead, Michael, and, and get us started, please. Uh, so last week after the committee uh, Nolan and I talked over the phone about how to address some of the issues that were coming up in the farm worker assistance program. And Nolan had the idea to, to kind of shift focus pivot to make it not about a, a farm worker assistance program, but a farm worker retention program. And it's, it's about fitting into the, the economic business interruption criteria under the CARES Act. And I think that's a, it's a, it, it, 
it clearly, in my opinion, is eligible because it's a second tier effect. It's to, to help those businesses that are suffering a business interruption from COVID, which dairy is definitely and farms generally are. Um, you've heard testimony that farms have had to let go of employees and are basically down to just the, the, the residents, the farm owners that are trying to, to maintain and operate dairy barns. So this to me seems like a, a very clear way to, to go forward um, to uh, provide for the eligibility of who would be eligible. It would be someone that works at least 40 hours a week for a farm employer Plus any time missed due to illness or injury during that period of March 13th through May 15th, and they are not eligible to receive CARES Act funding. So someone that already got a stimulus payment would not be eligible for it. So if you were um, a farm worker that got your, your CARES Act stimulus, you, you would not qualify for this. Um, also, people that would not qualify would be members of the farm employer's family, an independent contractor, and an individual who received unemployment insurance benefits for any week during that March 13th through May 15th, 2020 period. Um, so I, I, the first thing I did, which you will see on page one, line three to five, is add a purpose section. The purpose is to assist farms that experience business interruption from COVID to continue to employ their workers by providing an economic incentive to farm workers. So I, I think that that specifically states that it's related to the business interruption and providing um, assistance to those businesses. Then if you can scroll down, Linda, you get a reference to what CARES Act funding is, that you get the definition of eligible farm worker, which I just walked through. You got the, what is not an eligible farm worker, which I also just walked through. So I think you can go to the next page, Linda. And then you get what is a farm, which is the definition effectively from the RAPs. A farm employer means the owner or operator of a farm where individuals are employed to conduct farming. Farming is the Act 250 definition, which is also the definition under the RAPs. You get the definition of personally identifiable information, which was the same in the previous draft. Um, this is the information that will be protected from public disclosure and will not be subject to Public Records Act uh, request. That takes you onto page three, where you get the establishment of the program. There's established a farm worker retention program to award eligible farm workers with a $500 direct relief grant payment as an incentive to assist farm employers in retaining employees during and after the declared state of emergency under 20 VSA chapter one due to COVID-19. Then you get the administration of the program. It's going to be administered by the agency of ag, but the agency is required to contract with the public or private entity to conduct outreach, provide application assistance, process grant applications and deliver assistance payments to eligible individuals. So it is going to be run through a third party contractor. The secretary is gonna adopt requirements, guidelines, procedures as necessary to implement the program. They shall not be required to do rulemaking to do any of those requirements or procedures. Then in the contract for implementation, notwithstanding any provision of law to the contrary, they don't have to do this through a competitive bid contract um, and that it's going to be deemed to qualify for the emergency situation under administrative bulletin 3.5. And then the contract with a public or private entity that will implement the program shall require that entity to issue grant payments to farm workers pursuant to the provisions of the section and pursuant to the procedures established by the secretary. Then you go on to the application process. So the language that you had seen before was the farm worker directly applying. This is not going to be that. This is going to be the, the employer um, is going to, to apply. So in order to enroll in the program and make employees eligible for grants, a farm employer shall submit to the secretary, the secretary's designee, 
a notice of enrollment in a form specified by the secretary on or before August 1st, 2020. The secretary shall require farm employers to certify that they are the employer of eligible farm workers. And as a condition of enrolling in the program, each farm employer shall agree not to require any eligible farm worker to pay an administrative fee or other charge in relation to the farm employer requesting or obtaining a grant payment. So the, the farm employer can't take a, a kind of a incentive to apply. They also agree not to reduce the hourly compensation, including any related bonuses or premiums of any eligible farm worker due to a, an awarded grant. A farm employer that has enrolled in the program shall make a request for grant payments in a form specified by the secretary for each eligible farm worker according to the requirements established by the secretary or secretary's designee. The secretary shall specify the information that must be provided for each eligible farm worker. When, farm employer, when a farm employer enrolls in the program and when grants are awarded, the secretary shall inform the farm employer and the eligible farm worker with a written notice that the grant may be subject to income tax and that the eligible farm worker's grant may be subject to withholding. And then for payment, each grant check from an, for an eligible farm worker shall be sent to the farm worker's farm employer, who shall give the check to the farm worker not more than five calendar days after the farm employer receives it. So that's, that's the same way that the essential worker um, program worked. Uh, similarly, similar to the essential worker program, the farm employer uh, is not required to enroll in the program. We're not, you can't really mandate that the farm employer apply for their employees. Um, and if you scroll down to page six, a farm employer that elects not to enroll or neglects or fails to submit a request for an eligible farm worker shall not be liable to its eligible farm workers for any amounts that they may have been entitled to receive under the program if the farm employer had enrolled. And then you come to the confidentiality provisions, all personally identifiable information that's collected uh, by the program, any entity of state government performing a function or any entity contracting to perform the function shall be kept confidential and shall be exempt from inspection and copying under the Public Records Act. In addition, the secretary shall ensure that any entity of state or government performing a function of the program or any entity that the secretary contracts with uh, implements appropriate procedures and safeguards to protect any personally identifiable information that it obtains in relation to the program and shall not disclose an individual's personally identifiable information to another state entity or contractor and complies with all applicable requirements of the personal personal identifiable information protection chapter in Title IX. Then there seems to be a false page break there. Can you go on to, then you get to the appropriation. Um, so the amount of 550 is appropriated in fiscal year 2020 from the coronavirus relief fund to, that should say the Agency of Agriculture for use in fiscal years 2020 and 2021 for administration of the payment of the grants from the Farm Worker Retention Program until December 2020, which is when all funds need to be expended. Um, and that should say December 30th, 2020. Uh, at, or until all monies have been awarded, provided that the agency may only use up to 9% of the total appropriation for the purposes of contracting for the administration of the program. So that's that's right. it. Um, I I did note to uh, Senator Hardy this morning about the personally identifiable information provision. That is only state law. The CARES Act funds have the authority for the federal treasury to do single audits of programs and states. So the federal authority, audit authority, they likely would not recognize that um, confidentiality provision of the personally identifiable information. The contractor or the state could assert when asked, 
but then the Treasury, the I, they would basically initiate an enforcement action in federal court, and the federal court would not recognize that state law. But the information resides in the contracting agency. The, contracting the information would reside with the contracted entity, yes. Now, that's an, this is another point I made to Senator yeah. Hardy. Um, because it's passing through a state agency, there needs to be accountability provisions that the state agency maintains in order to, to ensure that the program is operating um, according to fiscal diligence. And so there are, or there are grant provisions that are required under administrative bulletin. I can't remember if it's 3.5 or five. And um, so some of them is transparency to the, to, the, to the state agency that's providing the grant. So th there, there will be some transparency and accountability towards the state agency but in my opinion, I doubt the Secretary of Agriculture, the agency is gonna to get to that granular level of who each individual applicant is. Okay, uh, Senator Collimore. Thank you. So I have a couple of questions <clears throat> and forgive me if we've already gone over this, but I'm just not remembering it if we have. Why do we need an outside contractor? Why don't we just let the agency take care of this? Are we paying, how much are we gonna pay an outside contractor? Doesn't that take money away from what could otherwise be given away? So I think there's a couple of reasons uh, that have been discussed and maybe not as, as publicly as, as, as maybe desired. Um, one, if you, if you contract through some of the different um, entities that are out there, like the community uh, action providers, they, they already have, um, offices that are located around the state. So you have numerous options for a farm worker or farm employer to go and sign up for the program. You don't have to deal specifically with that central agency in Montpelier. You can go down the road to your local um, provider. Um, the second is the agency may not have capacity. Um, the agency is already kind of working at capacity and for to put a program on them right now, I think you would want to ask them whether or not they could run a program like this as well as potentially a contracted entity. And I think you wanted to give some, some confidence and surety to some of the people that may apply um, that their information was going to be um, somewhat insulated from, from uh, state enforcement and regulation. But I assume we're gonna pay this outside agency something. Yes, so you have that in there. It's a $550,000 appropriation and no more than 9% can be used for the contracting for administration. So 9% of 550, I'm just gonna say $55,000. Okay. Um, so my other thing I'm wondering, uh, wondering about the grant for the farm worker, I think you said, Michael, it's going to be subject to uh, income tax. Does that mean the farmer has to do matching taxes with both Social Security or state or federal taxes? So the, the, the tax law will apply to that, that employee as it, as it normally does, right? And, and, and the, the grant is income. And just like the essential worker grant, uh, it is, is likely subject to withholding. Unlike the essential worker program, I didn't include language that says that the state shall withhold um, any liability. Um, if the state does, then the state does. Uh, there's, there's just potential withholding. Um, the, the, whether or not they're gonna be paying social security whether or not they're gonna be playing UI, et cetera, et cetera. It really depends on, um, wow. depends on, on the employer and the employee. You know, farming in, in many respects, they, there, there are certain exemptions that a farmer doesn't have to pay. Um, 
So it, it will be about that that farm and that farm worker. The tax law should not change. Well, can can we be clear? Because in the hazard pay bill, uh, there was withholding, but it, it's not a wage. It's and and so it doesn't pass through the farm business in that sense. The, right. If I'm understanding, it's right. a grant that the worker needs to acknowledge as income, but right. is not part of their wages, therefore subject. I would have thought that fact uh, leaves the farmer, the business aside in that right. sense. That, that, that's a good point. And I, I think that that, um, I mean, it goes to my underlying statement that the tax law should not change. If it's not passing through the, the employer, then it's it's not a wage, but it is income to to the farmer farm worker. Um, so it will potentially be subject to withholding. So, in your opinion, Michael, the farmer will not be on the hook for the other half of it. You know, I. I I, I don't think they will, but I will double check with our tax, um, okay. with Abby and with the people that Abby's working with. Thank you. And, and you know, having noodled around the hazard pay that was structured similarly, that was very clear, uh, Senator Collimore, that that was why we did it as a grant. Um, hey, I'm um, just checking. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's an excellent question. We're definitely going to need to have confidence in the answer. Senator Hardy. Yeah, um, first of all, thank you very much, Michael and Nolan, for finding a new structure that hopefully will work. I, I, Michael, I, I haven't had a chance to read all of the stuff that you sent me this morning, um, but I, I still remain a little concerned about the confidentiality issue and how much information the state's going to have about individuals, um, because that was one of the reasons that we were thinking of trying to do it without federal funding. Um, so there may be a lot of these people who don't actually want to apply and that because they're worried and their employers are worried and that concerns me. So I don't know if there's any way we can make it even tighter, but <laughs> if not, then that's the reality. Um, and then I just wanted to go back and hear from the committee about the amount, um, if you're comfortable um, with the $500 or if you think we should go higher we're getting a lot of you know outside pressure from certain groups advocates saying we should be doing a, a more generous amount the 500 i believe michael is is equivalent to what the california program was that's that correct was why that's where we came up with that amount so um but i don't know if you can speak to the confidentiality more um, can i just try and ask it this way and and see if michael you agree um first of all if if we are found if there's a problem with the let's assume this goes into law and the feds had a real problem with it we the the worst case is that, that we, we would have to reimburse the cares money or the federal government through state dollars right there there would have to be a, the clawback and the reimbursement yes the well the that the next step is whether or not if they do initiate enforcement and they discover information whether or not they use that information in whatever way for whatever type of enforcement enforcement whether it's tax or otherwise yeah okay that's my concern is that it could be an immigration issue and that's why the the most the way we can however we can insulate it and keep it confidential. Um, the, better, the, the more we can do that, the better. I mean, I think that's the driving impetus behind pushing it to a, a, a partner nonprofit. <clears throat> um, I think the partner nonprofit is, is one layer of insulation. The personally identifiable pr protection is another level of insulation. The, mandate that it not be shared or disclosed except for administration of the program is another level level of insulation but that does not entirely insulate the program from a federal audit authority can we have it so that the the contracting entity 
collects all the information and then says to the state, we have a hundred people who want, who, who qualify. And so we get, you know, 500, uh, uh, sorry, $5,000. That entity gets a $5,000 check and then they write the checks to the individuals. So the state doesn't ever get the names of the individuals or is that not kosher? <laughs> um, the way that the program set up, the farm employer is, is going to apply, um, enrolls, certifies they have covered eligible farm workers, <laughs> provide some information to support that. Um, it's not real specific as to what information needs to be provided because you're leaving that basically up to the agency and the contracting entity to, to formulate. Um, and so at that point, it, it's, if that information is available to the contracting entity, uh, the agency could just ask how many farm employers applied for how many farm employees. Um, and so that, that, that is the type of granular data I think the agency could request. Now you don't have in here that type of limitation that that's all that could be, could be provided, just the aggregate information. You could build into it that the contracting entities shall only share with the state the aggregate information about the number of eligible farm employees that received assistance. But Senator Hardy's asking about the actual checks. Is the is the contracting agency writing the checks? Well, that's that's what I just I, I wrote into the bill this morning at the request of of Senator Hardy that there's a now a payment provision, which I apologize, I, it was not clear in what I had sent out before. Um, so each grant check for an eligible worker shall be sent to the farm workers employer. It should be shall be sent by the contracting entity okay. to the farm workers and farm okay. That makes sense. Then, then it's clear that the checks are being written by the contractor. Um, yep. And that the state doesn't necessarily need to know that the contractor needs to know, but the state doesn't need to know that Chris Pearson is one of those farm workers or whomever. <laughs> right. Um, okay. No one's got something to offer. Yeah. No I one. just want to also add in, uh, for the record, Nolan Langwell, the joint case of bosses. Um, a lot of the farm employers won't actually know whether their, empl their employees are eligible, as in, did they get a CARES Act check or whatever? So they actually will have to ask their employees, but um, that's not unprecedented. And uh, Senator Pearson, you may remember with the employer assessment, employers have to ask, like they don't know what their employees' insurance coverage is. So they have to ask them when they go and they file their EC1 form. So it's not unprecedented for employers to have to ask their employees these things, but I wanted to just, that's a sort of a administrative piece that I want people to be aware of. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, to that end, does that infer any um, liability on the farmer, on the farm business um, to having uncovered that detail? Does that, uh, does that expose them to, um, you know, knowledge that that they they may be working with a migrant worker. And this whole thing operates on a sort of strange cloud of feigned ignorance, right? Right. Well, one of one of the um, the language in front of you doesn't reflect it, but when when Nolan and I were talking about it on Friday, one of our thoughts was the employer just asked if they received a payment under the CARES Act. And that's, that's something you just ask if they received it. And that's something that, that can be checked by the state if, if they really wanted to check that. Um, a lot of people haven't are eligible and have not received them yet. Well, well, that's what Senator Hardy's point was this morning, that, 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 that because of the backlog in the check writing that 
people that are going to receive it haven't received it yet. And that's why it says eligible uh, instead of received it. It's, it's, a, it's a good point, um, but we were trying to, to cut down on that employer's responsibility of determining whether or not the worker was eligible or not. Um, okay. Senator Plano. Is the, just backing up in a way, is the reason that it goes through the employer meant to protect the worker? In other words, the employer is the one applying for the money. The employer is the one who's asking whether or not they got the CARES funding. I just wonder what the rationale is for that. I, I presume there's a part of me that would presume it's because we don't think the farm worker would be able to come forward and request the money. I'm just wondering if there's more to it than that. Um, I, I think it's it's both um, that interest, but there's also an administrative efficiency issue. Instead of of having six farm workers apply, you have one farm employ your apply and so there is some efficiency built into it it's based off the essential worker concept of the the employer applying for the employees um, to cut down on that burden on the employee of having to deal with the administrative application process um, so it's it's both insulation but it's also administrative efficiency as well I'm not presuming this would happen, but there is a possibility that a farmer could choose not to apply, even though the workers deserve the money. Well, that's actually I'm not trying to say there's bad actors out there, but it is right. possible. No, that that is addressed in the bill. It says that the employer is not obligated to apply, and the employer has no uh, liability if they fail to apply or or they're negligent in applying, and a, an eligible worker doesn't get their payment. Um, so that, you know, protects, the, uh, that protects the employer. Yes. Well, this whole thing is, you know, a calculation of of trying to get this across and be protective, right? That that that's a real balance. Um, the yes. Uh, is there anything in here that gives you agency of ag uh, any money? To, to carry out their role? Um, no, and I mean, generally their role will be as the grant over, see so the grant um, supervisor. You, to my knowledge, don't give the agencies money to do that for any of their grants. Nolan, do they, do, do appropriations are they given to the agencies to to pass through a grant? That's a good question. I mean, I would guess that in many instances the agencies have grant administrators, uh, and the question is how much workload is there associated with being a grant administrator? For, you know, adding to someone's existing workload. I can't imagine that this is require an FTE to implement this program, or even a half or a quarter. It would be like a point one FTE time. Tops. So I don't, it's a great question. I don't know the answer. Okay. Uh, yeah, Senator Hardy. Um, if, if the committee is willing, if we can, you know, reinsert this version um, into our bigger package, and then I think it might be, I think it would be valuable to get somebody from the agency in here. And the person who I think knows the most about this area is Allison Eastman. Um, and see what her thoughts on, or I can even just send it to her and just say, what, what do you think? Um, but having her in to, to talk to us about it. I, I mean, we've been going through lots of hoops to try to make something work so that we can get some payments out to these farm workers who worked through this crisis and have families to support and bills to pay just like the rest of us and try to acknowledge the importance of their work to the dairy industry. Um, and I guess again, are you, are you guys comfortable with the five hundred dollars? Is that does that seem like a reasonable amount? Um, and Nolan and I have been talking a lot about how many workers there are, and right now this assumes a thousand would 
would apply and qualify, which is kind of the middle point of the, the huge estimate variation that we have for the number of these farm workers. Um, so I just sort of picked the middle point as saying, this makes sense, but. And that's well, why I was... there's the language saying until funds are expended or whatever as well, so that it's, yes. Yeah. I mean, I would certainly go on record as supporting a higher a higher amount. I mean, the thing is, we're reimbursing people for expenses that they've had while they've continued to work. We have no idea how long this is going to go on. Um, you know, if it goes on more months or more, I mean, it seems like five hundred dollars is not going to go very far compared to the amount of work these folks are doing. So, I'm not supposing there's appetite in the committee or in the Senate to go higher, but I would certainly prefer us to provide more more support, higher payments. I'm fine with where it is. Uh, if, I think for now we should leave it where it is as we're going to be taking temperatures on on this sort of idea uh, around the, um, you know, in some ways, if we think the federal money is eligible, then it might be possible to up it. But I think before we talk about that, we should see what kind of buy-in there is for the concept. Yeah, I mean, everybody's pleading with us to increase the amount of money we're going to give to the dairy industry in general. I mean, it's, you know, people are wanting to go from 8 million to 9 million to 40 million to 50 million. And the workers are sort of sticking around to 500 and they're not, they don't seem to be going any higher. So I just think they deserve to be higher consideration. But, but I hear you. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that any of us disagree. Um, so um, have we, Senator Hardy, have you talked to any potential um, organization that would help us administer this? I mean, we're, we're assuming that somebody would step forward. Um, and I'm curious if we, we, we would presumably want to talk to them uh, if it's the OEOs or whatever, but um, have, do you have any insight there? I haven't had direct conversations because I was waiting to see how we structured this and what it might entail, but I, the, the organizations that we heard from that I think makes sense in, in a lot of ways are the Open Door Clinic here in Addison County, and then potentially Bridges to Health that's at UVM, and they have connections in the Franklin County area the Addison and Franklin are the two counties that have the vast majority of these workers. And then, you know, sort of branching out to the other counties, they could probably even cover some of that. They already have relationships with the farms and the farm workers. So that was my thought. I mean, uh, Nolan and Michael also mentioned the OE, the OEOs <laughs> um, as a potential, and they're all over the state. But I just don't think there are that many migrant farm workers in you know, Wyndham County or I don't know, but. Um. Well, that sparks another question for me that there are a lot of workers on farms that were not eligible for the federal stimulus who are not a dairy, on dairies. And um, does that concern you, Michael, um, in terms of eligibility of the federal use? Um, you know, if they're, I mean, they're not apple pickers yet, but, uh, a lot of vegetable producers, others also have, um, migrant workers. So I'm just, just walk us through that. Maybe it's a scale, uh, the overwhelming majority of them are at dairy, but just help us understand that dynamic, please. I'm, I'm not sure why it would be different from a, a covered employer, the farm employer, that's a dairy. If, if they have workers that were not eligible for CARES Act funding um, and are otherwise eligible, they can come forward and apply uh, for the grant for their workers just as a dairy would. Uh, is there an assertion that they have had a negative impact economically from COVID? That's, that's what I'm wondering about. Um, there is no requirement that the employer show loss or added expense due to COVID. Um, it's just basically an, a, a, 
it's an incentive to the farm worker to stay. Um, it gives them a added extra financial assistance um, to cover potential losses that a farm may have had. Thank you, Senator Hardy. Yeah, I was just going to note that that many of the other um, farm workers that you know work for Apple Farms or or uh, vegetable farms are H two A workers. And many of them, we got testimony that many of them weren't actually here yet during most of this crisis and they just started arriving in April. And the way that this is structured is that they had to have been working from March 13th through May 15th, which I think is the same timeline that the Central Workers Program has laid out. Um, and that there were some farms even, uh, for example, the turkey farm we heard from that had H2A workers here and then they were sent home at the beginning of this crisis. So I think a lot of those other um, migrant farm workers weren't actually in the state or were only in the state for a very small portion of the two month sort of height of the current height of this crisis. Um, so it, there may be other farms that have other farm workers um, but I don't know that there are going to be a lot of them, is my impression. I, I think there's going to be some um, some additional eligible individuals. Um, in the email this morning, Senator Hardy, you may not have read it. I think, and no one can correct me, a dependent that's 20 years or younger um, would not qualify for the CARES Act funding, but could be a farm worker that would qualify for this. It's it, you're either 19 or 20, you can still be a dependent of your parents and they, they would not have qualified for CARES Act funding, but they would qualify for this. This. Yes, you're right. I have a 19 year old. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so that, that, that does speak to what you were saying, Nolan. I didn't read that yet, Michael. I'm sorry. Um, but that does speak to maybe upping the numbers a little bit. So maybe it is a little bit more than the 500,000. So yeah, thank you. That's a good point. Okay. Any other questions on this one? Senator Collimore. Thank you, Chris. So Ruth, you mentioned that there were potentially a thousand um, workers that we were talking about. Do we know for sure whether the majority of those folks are actually not getting paid by the farmers? Oh, they're getting paid by the farmers. They, they just didn't get the CARES Act. Wait, wait, what do you mean? I don't know if I understand your question. Well, I was under the impression that times when we were talking that they'd lost their job somehow and they weren't getting paid. Is that not? No. Uh, well, the way that this is structured is that it, this would be helping farmers to hold on to those workers. So there are a few farms that have gone out and farm workers have been laid off. Um, so uh, this would be not necessarily unemployment for those in that sense, but it would be for the farm workers who were retained and did work through those two months. Okay. Is that it's your question? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a retention program. And it acknowledges that they did not get the, or will not get the twelve hundred dollars from the IRS. Um, Understood. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Uh, and then what uh, the the grant the the grant administrator presumably in the agency come up with a first come first serve or whatever. So if it turns out there's two thousand people we would get that feedback and potentially react. Is that, am I right about that? But but we have locked it at $500 per person. It's not, you know, we think it's 500, but then tw twice as many people apply and it's 250. Do I have that right? Yeah, it, it says 500 per person in it. It's just a matter of how much we appropriate. So we might want to put a little bit more in for the that 19 and 20 year old portion that I hadn't thought of. Um, I don't know how many of those are, but. Okay, well, we have a framework. We think we've figured out a way to get it into through federal funds. This is big progress. Uh, and, and we need to talk to more people and see if the concept uh, is workable. Anything else on this before we shift gears? Okay, Michael, you're gotta go, I think, right? I do. 
Uh, I just want to note that um, if you're going to talk about the the proposals from Ellen and Abby, uh, to just keep in mind the criteria for the spending and the fact that it needs to be spent by December 30th. And I bring that up because one of the proposals I saw was for FTEs. And I don't know how FTEs fit into that has to be spent by December 30th. I, I don't, we, I always wanted to talk to Nolan about that. Could you like give the money out to, to um, as a grant to an association to hire an FTE and is that expenditure, right? I don't, I don't know. So there, there's some questions there about the criteria. And, and uh, Jen, Jen Carby actually was asked the same question in a different committee. And I might suggest, Michael, you talk with her because she said that her, I don't want to quote her too much, but it, it made it sound like her interpretation at the time was that the money has to be spent even by the grant, even by the contractor. But I would say we should, we need to double check all that. Right. If you look at the notes from the discussion with Treasury that NCSL Malfo had, it really it it does lead to that conclusion that even the grantee has to spend that money, and and that's that might be difficult for some of those proposals. Okay, yeah, I, I agree. I I I said I thought the same thing. So thanks for mentioning that. Okay. Yeah, I'll see you at eleven. Okay, thank you, Michael. And just um, one last thing on that, if I may, yeah. is that although there's conversations in at the federal level about trying to create more uh, uh, leniency with the current CARES funding, we don't know. We have to obviously we have to operate on the world we live in now. Three months from now, it could be different, but this is the world we're in now. So just want to say that. Yeah, it's quite a world. Okay, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so uh, Linda, just pop in here you just said what is it i'm documenting percent with revisions so linda just messaged me that she has a document from the agency linda what what is that a revision to our language or that's what they're proposing at, at 11. no this is a revision uh to your language on okay. on the farmer assistance bill it is what they sent was the farmer assistance bill with some highlighted areas they want changed. I think unless committee disagrees, I think we should wait and hear from the agency at once. Um, I, uh, does that make sense? Yeah, and I would like the chair to be here too. Yeah. Um, so what, um, just Without without staff here, well, Nolan, thank you for listening. But uh, as we as we look at our current bill, we have the dairy portion. Um, let me see if I can pull it up. Hold on, I've got to get another screen going here. We have. Um, Linda, uh, Linda, where would I go to find the draft? Michael's little, oh, hold on. I was gonna ask that too. Um, he just sent it right before he came online. So okay. I can put it on the screen or I can put it on your webpage. Um, I, think, I think we should put it on the, web. have we been putting any of the drafts on the webpage? We have, and sometimes, and sometimes we haven't. <laughs> okay. All right, go ahead and put that on the webpage under Michael for today. Um, and it's labeled a draft. This is, you know, people just have to bear with us as we all learn how to have Zoom democracy as somebody framed it the other day. I just want us to kind of look at not language, but sections and, and understand uh, the different pieces of what we have, what we have talked about, what we think we want to 
potentially include as we move forward. Um, and does anybody else need a two minute break? Let's sure. Let's take a, a, a very quick break. Don't leave us streaming, uh, Linda. And if you can post that, and um, and then by the time we get back, we'll be back, and I'll fill my coffee cup. Okay, okay I'll, I'll mute you all. Thanks. So I'm just documenting, we've got the dairy, we've got non-dairy, we've got farm workers. I'm just looking for the headings. And we just, and this does not, I assume, reflect what we just walked through. Well, maybe it does. Uh, we've got the, the worker safety. Do we have any update on that? Senator Hardy, this is something you've been focused on. This is around VOSHA and getting Spanish language stuff. Yeah, so I spoke with, um, you probably remember Dan Baker, the UVM professor, who was the one who gave us all that really interesting data about migrant farm workers and his uh, research. Um, he was the one that initially proposed that that was something we might want to consider including. Um, I spoke with him yesterday or the day before, I can't remember. Um, and he's actually meeting with Laura Ginsburg at the agency um, and is hoping that the agency may be interested in including it in the dairy innovation grant that they're working on, um, which is something I had asked the chair if we could have Laura in to talk about, because uh, I think that's a, another source of funding for dairy um, that is more sort of big picture. Um, uh, so anyway, I think that for now we could probably put a, you know, not include that in our proposal because it may actually be more appropriate to have in that dairy innovation grant, which is a regional thing to have a regional program. Um, okay, and why would we believe that that will change quickly? <laughs> that That is a good, Fair point. Um, I, I think, uh, I mean, we could certainly include it in our bill and hear what Laura has to say about it. Um, I think he was trying to, you know, get the agency to partner in the efforts and they were interested in it. Um, so if we think we want to uh, do it in here and not have her, I, I guess just maybe talking to Laura about what she thinks is the best strategy in terms of the grant versus this you mind doing that offline sure i can yeah i can talk to her okay um i think that'd be good because it, it is timely um but if there's a more natural fit for it um and then we we, we haven't talked about this a lot then there's the working lands future of food security did i miss that discussion or or did we just is that just a placeholder My recollection is that was a placeholder yeah. okay. that we were waiting to hear more details from them, but we did get some more details. So maybe we plop in what we heard from them. Okay, so that's, so, so that's what we have now. Um, we just got uh, an email uh, from Gus uh, and Ella. So I just want to keep that on the list unless anybody, well, does everybody agree that we should at least talk that through? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, if Michael, is Michael coming back that, um, yep. there's a whole bunch of yellow in here that he changed since the last time I'd like to. Yeah, I, I, I'm not, I don't think given that we don't have the chair and that, we're about to hear a, a more presumably concrete proposal from the administration that we should worry about wording at this moment. Okay. I'm interested in collecting sort of the the chapters of the bill, if you like, of what we what we aim to do. Um, so. So far, we've got dairy, non-dairy, we've got the farm workers, we've got this worker safety piece, we've got some kind of working lands, uh, food security, we've got um, Gus's uh, planning kind of uh, 
what what how would we care characterize the work that Ella does? Um, economic development for yeah, it's kind of business assistance the way she's looking at it for farmers. I mean, it fits into the idea of um, helping farmers who were talking about getting this relatively small grants to adapt to the new markets and whatnot. I think yeah. that's a large part of what they're talking about is their ability to work with farmers to do that kind of stuff. Um, okay. Are there other broad areas? Um, we, we, sure. Well, we, we haven't plugged in anything to do with hunger, really, or food security in terms of the bill. I mean, we've talked about it a bunch, but we haven't actually plugged it in anywhere. Well, I think it is considered in the working lands placeholder. Uh, sure, but, that, but in terms of like funding, like the farmer to feeding, what it's called, Vermont receding Vermonters, or I forget what it's called, but there's a couple of particular programs um, that the food bank and NOFA operate that are existing programs that we've been encouraged to better fund. Okay. Yeah, I agree with Anthony. I think having a placeholder for them. And there was also in the, the stuff that we got from Abby and Ellen, there was a proposal that, um, you know, the EBT cards for the yeah. SNAP program, yeah. Yeah. Um, they actually need uh, the EBT readers. And those seem like a really good thing to use the funding for. I think they need 50 of them. I don't know. The numbers are in Ellen and or Abby's thing. And, you know, that's it allows people who are on food assistance programs to use their cards at uh, CSAs and farm farmers markets and online ordering and stuff like that. But it's an equipment issue. They just don't have enough equipment. So, and then also funding that program, giving more money to that program to allow lower income Vermonters to buy food at these places. So I think that is, a, and the Vermonters feeding Vermonters program is another, and then school school food uh chris i don't know how we want to get back to that i don't know if our bill makes as much sense anymore but something in that area would i think be relevant well i think it makes sense at whether yes, or not I mean, in the context of the timing yeah. uh, well it okay. actually makes it makes sense to actually increase the, the the goal i think i mean move it up higher percentage yeah, I think the, the goal definitely still makes sense, whether the logistics make sense, given the stress on school districts um, right. is it's what true. I'm more concerned with. True. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're just beginning to fully appreciate uh, how the state's gonna respond to a $400 million budget challenge, so. So Ruth, let me ask, because you're in education, it, I assume that, um, Dan French hasn't made any decision yet about the fall in terms of schools reopening, that kind of thing. No, I, the not any final decision. I mean, they are working under the assumption that schools will be open in person in some capacity. Um, how, what the details of that are, are still in the work. And a lot of what they'll be doing this summer is planning for how that can, can work. But I think you know, all things remaining the way they are or getting better, the, the plan is to have schools open. Okay. I saw something, I'm not sure what, where it was. I think it was Colorado. The governor there was talking about the fact that there'll be a certain number of parents who will choose not to send their kids back to what we'll call traditional uh, educational settings because of concern but that it actually could be, a, I don't want to say it's a good thing, it would make the distancing situations a little easier to do because there will be fewer students in classrooms. I, I thought that was, I never thought about that, but it, it makes sense. Yeah, I think that there, the, the potential for some kind of hybrid model where there's some distance education and some in-person education is, is, is uh, set certainly on the table as an option because you're right, distancing, social dis uh, physical distancing in a school building is extremely difficult, especially with you know, students who may or may not comply 100% or be able to given their age and their development. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, so 
Uh, and then did anyone have the chance to look? I, I do think we'll get the chance to hear from Betsy and Vermont Feed and, and those guys. Uh, they sent a request to all of us to, to, but I didn't, I don't know if any, uh, yesterday was just slam for me. Um, did anyone read their, did they have a proposal attached or was it just a request to talk to us? It was just a request to talk to us. I emailed Betsy back and asked her to get to send us details um, similar to what Ellen and Abby sent us. I was like, we, it'd be helpful to have a list. <laughs> okay, so I'll just put them on the list of, of uh, people we wanna hear because they are going right at this food security, I think. Yeah, and, and one of the groups, of NOF is one of the groups that they're is part of their little coalition Monty, and no yep. had written us a letter a while ago that laid out some of those hunger programs and explained briefly what they were and what they were recommending in terms of funding for them so we can take a look at that when we get a chance to yep. okay and it's all about you know making this work under the federal money it is remarkable we're going to have record uh state fund deficits and we're going to struggle to spend the COVID relief money in time and not return it. <laughs> it's, uh, we're rich on one side and broke on the other. <laughs> well, federal government helps you out by making it difficult for you to spend the money they're giving you. Yeah, it, it, it is quite a state of affairs. However, uh, on just the COVID relief, there are potentially some interesting ways to try to use that money to bolster not just uh you know the very short term but hopefully uh, and i think we're all somewhat united on this trying to make uh investments that satisfy the short term and could be a little more enduring um what about should we go back to the idea of uh, how we want to talk about um, the dairy grant and what a survey looks like or, or the conditions at, or the application. I've been struggling with, you know, it's always scary to write this into legislation. And then if you write vague concepts, you don't get what you're after. Um, I haven't had the chance to look, was it Ella that sent us their intake application? Yeah, Ella sent us the one that BHCB has been using. It's very specific to the immediate crisis. Um, you know, what do you need right now? Um, so it seems to me that it would need to be broader than that. But I don't know if we want to spend time on the specifics of the dairy language until we see what the agency might be proposing. They may have something in there already. Um, yeah. The, the other thing that I was just scrolling through the stuff that um, Ellen and Abby sent, and both of them have ideas about marketing, and I think that that might be something that we might want to consider, um, a sort of marketing blitz um, that about local foods and supporting farmers and how you can do it um, in a crisis and um, really get people to understand a little bit more about what options are and where they can buy food. Um, Is and that in their email? It, it was, it's on their list of things. Um, they had various, and marketing was already something they were sort of pushing for, but you know, if we have to spend money quick, yeah, Brian, you're the marketing guy. So, you know, if you have ideas for that, but it seems to me like that could be a, a good way of supporting markets. And then they also have some things about food hubs and distribution in there, which I know, Chris, you're really interested in. And Ellen also included, and I don't know if this is necessarily something for our committee, if we might wanna uh, alert Michael and his committee about it, but um, about assisting restaurant owners, um, because a lot of them are in huge crisis right now and are, and I think it was to uh, pr pr uh, protect them from bankruptcy. Um, yeah, there, there, there can be no question that we will do something for restaurants. I, I mean, that that's a vital piece, uh, and and of course, very relevant as we continue to, you know, only gently ease in um, both restaurant businesses and tourism. So, 
I'm pretty confident that will happen. Um, what about the idea of this? Um, who who is the woman, Ruth? I think you got us connected to. She's a vegetable producer in Addison County. She has to take her product to the neighbor farm because that's where Reinhardt will pick it up. Yeah, that was a. Uh, it was Blue Ledge. Yeah, Blue Ledge Farm. Hannah Sessions. Uh, so it's a goat goat cheese, and she. They used to come right to her farm, but now they don't. She takes it to a neighboring farm. I, I just keep wondering if this would be an infrastructure thing that's very related to the food security issue of trying to have um, you know, distribution systems that are effective and respond to the growth in demand for, our, for local food or for food. Um, local food it's just, just sort of a I, I don't know I, I maybe maybe it's worth talking to somebody at Reinhardt but but how can we um you know blue blue was it spruce who was it ledge ledge blue ledge so so that business you know used to get directly picked up now can partner with a neighbor but what about the little little producer that um, doesn't have those connections. That this is just what haunts me. It's like, how hard could it be for us to facilitate that? Um, you know, it doesn't have to be terribly expensive. It's sort of a strategy thing. It seems to me. I guess I'm unclear what you're asking, Chris. Well, if you, I think if, we're talking about trying to build a more efficient distribution network essentially pick up and distribution okay. network which i think is part of an infrastructure that needs to be talked about and i think that there might have been some in what um either ellen kaler or abby's thing they're kind of long i read them but i think that one of them talked spoke to that a bit and also spoke to the idea of processing plants as a way they talked about processing meat particularly and laid out some numbers and some goals around that. So I think it, people see it as a part of what we're trying to do. If it qualifies for funds is another question. I mean, I think it does, obviously, but I'm prejudiced. I mean, because it's trying to, well, it's trying to meet the new market demand. You know, they screwed up the market by, with the pandemic. So we're um, talking about rebuilding a new kind of market, which means new kind of structures. Trying to protect against the second wave. Right. Um, it could, it strikes me that could be something we try to direct through the working lands if we if we end up giving them a uh, a sort of short term grant. Yeah, I agree. They're also not in the letter that Gus sent. I only skimmed it, but they were not asking for a huge amount of money. They were they're, they're into leveraging money, so they, that's pretty modest what they're talking about compared to what you get for it in return. Yep. Yeah, um, I, mean, I would just uh, the the stuff that Abby sent. She has time frames on hers, which I think are really helpful. You know, the uh, Anthony just mentioned the meat processing um, and this issue of dairy having to call some herd, some of their herd, and how do we sort of glide that onto the market so that there's the the processing plants can our our slaughterhouses can can handle the increase and, and Abby has a proposal from that and it's, you know, the time frame is June through December of 2020. So that seems to me that that would be something that would really be helpful and it would also be working with the Vermont Food Bank to get some of the beef that is produced. Um, so that seems like a huge win, 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 you know, get more be get more of the farmers some money for their culled herd, um, get it processed, get it onto the market, but also getting some of it to the food bank directly. Yeah. Good protein. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, I'm satisfied that we have a good list. We've we've poked around. Some of these issues are more worked out than others, and I'd be glad to bring this up with the chair and sort of. Uh, you know, we, we, we were moving very quickly into the wording and, um, 
I think it's important now that we have a, well, I don't know that I would say I'm clear on the timeline, but it's clear that this is going to be a little more organized in terms of a, a overall economic recovery package. So um, there, there, if, if people have other things you kind of want in the menu, um, we should bring that forward now or quickly. Yeah. Sorry. I'm also looking at, um, Abby had brought up the um, product associations, you know, uh, like the Vermont Cheese Council, Ver Vermont Fresh Network, the Brewers Association, there's probably the Maple Organization, those organizations, and maybe that's the way we sort of direct some of the marketing money, but also um, immediate, you know, payments to them to help their members um, through the, the, the crisis too and that's a more immediate term so that may be a way of stretching this out across uh across sectors mm -hmm. yeah that strikes me as a sort of a different strategy for the the um we have already in our bill in terms of um agricultural producers which is non-dairy um, but it's a good thing to keep in mind or or a little bit of both. Um, so I don't know, we can, we can take a break. Brian, you mentioned, and it wouldn't hurt my feelings to watch the governor's press conference at 11, but we also potentially have uh, Michael back uh, around 11. He's at another committee until 11, but we know sometimes that goes long to start walking through the miscellaneous ag bill, um, which there's not a great hurry on, but we're clearly going to have to put our attention to. So what do, what do people want to do? Um, do you want to come back at 11 with Michael and do the miscellaneous ag? We probably should do that. Although I, I wonder whether Bobby has seen it yet. My guess is he's probably looked at it. Um, I mean, if we have a walkthrough with Michael and he's not here, we're either going to have to catch him up or we're going to have to do it again when he gets back. Well, so he, he, he built the agenda and he told me that, you know, if you need time, you should, you should do this. So um, the other possibility would be to watch some of the governor's thing, you know, it starts at 11. It's, it's not, you, we don't have to sit through all the questions and answers and all the follow up and all that, but listen to what he says at 11 and come back together again at 20 after 11 or 1130 for a half hour and go through the bill briefly. Okay. Do people like that idea? I do like that idea, Anthony. I'm and presuming they show it on, it's, a, it's live on, I haven't watched any of them. They're live on TV. It's on They're channel three and it's on radio. Yeah. Okay. I can listen to it on radio. It also never starts at 11. Well, that's true. Yeah, the, we, they may not get to even get to the part part that's relevant to us by 1120, but we can try. Maybe that'll well, be up front. <laughs> let's say 1130. That also gives us a great, better likelihood that Michael will be back with us. So Linda, are you able to hear this? Yes. If you can, um, we'll, we'll go offline in a moment here and we'll reconvene in an hour with Michael for the purposes of walking through the miscellaneous ag bill. And then in the meantime, those yeah. of us that yeah. Okay, I will, I'll put you all on mute and I'll put a notice up that the committee will be back on this video at 1130. Sure, will that be streaming the whole time? Too bad we can't put the governor on our-, on our, on I, our can send, I can send you thing. another, uh, uh, at invitation to oh. another meeting, or we can do it that way. I'm not sure I care how you do it. Um, we'll get back on this one um, unless you send us something in the meantime. But but importantly, if you can alert Michael that we don't need him until 1130. We'll do. Okay, everybody. Okay. Yeah, good. See Thanks. you soon. Bye. See you I guess we'll. Hello, Michael. Thank you. Uh, so we, we just so you know, Michael, we compiled kind of our list of, of uh, the menu that 
we'd at least like to discuss for the relief bill. Most of that, well, about half of it is already in there. Um, so I'll work with uh, the chair on uh, figuring out that discussion. And if you were listening to the governor's press conference, Secretary of Agriculture just suggested they were proposing $50 million relief package for farms or dairy, really, dairy and processors. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, more than we were contemplating, but in a similar vein to much of our work. So, so um, with, would that be in one-time payments or over the four-month period? Uh, it's our hope that we will have uh, somebody from the agency in on Friday to walk us through their proposal. I know the chair was working on that uh, when I talked to him last night, or was that was his hope. Uh, Secretary sure. Chevitz did not give us much detail on that, but my understanding is it's a one-time payment. So in other words, if, and I forget, I think it was our large farms, we were going to go 50,000, 50,000, 50,000, or 150 in one lump sum. This would be the one lump sum, but I don't know what that number is going to be. Yeah. Kind of thing. Um, right. So we'll hope to get more details either Friday or early next week. Senator Hardy. But there was nothing in their package for anything beyond dairy and cheese. Um, so I would assume that that's something we would want to make sure we cover. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, you, you said they mentioned so, 70 million for processors. And it's inter be interesting to see what those processors are. Are they just dairy processors? I as think opposed we, to meat and other things that we need to do? Yeah, I don't know. It was 10 million, and I don't know uh, where it's earmarked. That's right. No, we'll, we'll look for those details. And uh, of course, it's just a proposal the way the budget is a proposal at the beginning of our process. They, they have to partner with the legislature. We look forward to partnering with them and, and injecting uh, some of our own ideas and also uh, complementing what they're trying to do. So um, at the moment, so we'll hear from them as soon as we can, hopefully Friday, if not early next week. Um, given that the, the next stop after we do this relief package will be miscellaneous ag. Michael, would you, uh, we might as well take your time now. We have 25 minutes left. And if, if you uh, could just start introducing us to that house proposal that's now in our possession. Um, Sure. Um, all right. That's what I was just going to ask for. Um, Thank you. Is it also on the website? Yeah. Yes. Sure. Yes. Um, so H656 is an act relating to miscellaneous ag subjects. The first sec, and I'll just be clear, it really is miscellaneous. There's, there's a ton of different stuff in here, very different subject matter. The first section relates to commercial feed and a prohibition on page two, sub D, that would prohibit a person from distributing a commercial feed product in the state that is labeled as bait or feed for white-tailed deer. And that's on page two. Could you say that again, Michael? So, so Right now, there's requirements for commercial feed in the state, including the labeling of commercial feed. And it is currently prohibited to take deer through baiting. Okay. And there are people that are selling commercial feed in the state that is labeled as bait for white-tailed deer. And the agency would like to prohibit people from distributing commercial feed that is labeled as bait for white-tailed deer. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Linda, okay. could you just scroll up a tiny bit? Um, sorry, no, there, there's underlying language that Michael's describing and a little bit down page two. Um, so, Michael, how does that work? It, you're very specific about the labeled. 
So what if they just don't label it as bait and then uh, I mean, well, well, a small uh, thing to alter the label in this case. Right. So um, there is legitimate use of, of feed for deer in Vermont. There is a captive deer facility in Vermont. And so you can sell feed for deer. Um, that, that is a legitimate use and, and, the, and the feed is not just limited to, to use for deer. So there, there are legitimate uses for it. And that, then it's, if somebody takes that legitimate feed and, and uses it to take a deer with that bait, well, then that's a fish and game violation. It's a criminal violation. It's a felony violation actually um, with imprisonment. So that, that's, that's how that would play out. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, moving down to section two, these are require, record keeping requirements for livestock transporters. You may not remember, but a couple of years ago, and you can go on to page three, Linda, you um, did a substantial redraft of the um, requirements for the handling of of livestock, including their transport and traceability. And you required uh, livestock transporters, haulers, et cetera, to maintain uh, records compliant with the applicable state and federal statute rules and regulations. And what the agency was looking there for was basically information about what livestock haulers and transporters were doing, what they were purchasing, et cetera. But as it turns out, under, under the USDA rules, there are some times when uh, a hauler doesn't have to include certain information. And the agency wants this information. So on page three, you'll say, when not required under the requirements set forth in state and federal statutes, the records that a, a livestock hauler transporter needs to maintain shall include livestock purchase, repossessed, sold, or loaned, by a livestock dealer, transporter, packer, the complete name and address of the person from whom livestock was obtained and to whom delivered, the official individual ID number that is required. Uh, and for equine livestock, there's a, a separate set of requirements that are, are elsewhere in statute. But it's just to make clear that even though the federal rule might not require it, the agency still wants this information for haulers, packers, and transporters. It's, it's about accountability and, and managing the system. And, and they think it's, it's worthwhile information um, to maintain. So should I move on? Ryan, did you have a question? Yeah, I'm just making sure. Um, so the transporter would just have to have the record, but that yep. person is not sending that to any agency, right? No, it, it's 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 one of those records where the agency asks them to to maintain it subject to their inspection, but it's okay. not required to be submitted to the agency. And this isn't, in essence, asking them to do anything more than they're already doing. Well, they they may already be required to do it if they're if they're um, triggering an activity that's covered by federal rule or other applicable state statute. But there are situations where they're not required to do it by federal rule, and the agency still wants that information in those instances. Okay, thank you. Um, section three, I don't think any of you were on the committee um, when the issue of testing captive deer for chronic wasting disease came up. But uh, at that time, the debate was whether or not the state should pay for the testing of captive deer or whether the um, owner of the captive deer should pay for the testing. Testing is required under federal rule, the Animal Plant Health Inspection and Safety Division of USDA requires chronic deer, uh, captive deer to be tested for chronic wasting disease when slaughtered. Um, the committee, the Senate Ag Committee, uh, included this provision that the Secretary of Ag shall pay for the testing. The Secretary, the Agency of Ag is asking now that that uh, requirement be shifted to the operator of the captive deer operation um, from which the tested captive deer originated. Can you give us a sense of what the cost is? 
Um, uh, it's not substantial, um, but it is in the thousands of dollars. It depends on the number of deer that are sent um, to slaughter and then are required to be tested. I, I, I remember that when this was changed a few years ago, it was, it was about $15,000 and there's fewer captive deer facilities now. So it's probably less. Um, but that's that uh, the agency could probably give you how much they paid for it last year. So Michael, they're tested at that slaughter time. Is that when they're, when they're tested, not just randomly? No, you have to test the brain. Okay. Um, so it's, it's at, it's at slaughter. Okay. Or after slaughter. How many, cap how many captive deer operations are there? I think currently there's only one. Oh. Yeah, I think it's it's in my district. I, it's pretty close to where I live. Are there other comparable types of tests for other kinds of livestock, Michael, that are either paid for by the state or paid for by the producer? Um, there, there are other testing, whether it's brucellosis or, or those other required testing. Um, I, I can't tell you who pays for them. My intuition is that it's on the producer, but I would need to double check that. Yeah, I, I just, if this is making it more consistent with other types of livestock, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and you know. it, it's a federally required test, you said, right? Yes, the, the, the requirement to test is federally required. And I'm just wondering if the rationale by the agency was just to, well, I don't know how else to say it, save money in their budget? Um, uh, I think the agency has a, um, a philosophical perspective as well. Okay. That that uh, the the cost should be borne by the the livestock um, producer, and not by the state. Okay. Um, so. Okay. So I'm looking at the brucellosis and tuberculosis testing requirements, and I don't see. It just says that the producer shall ensure that they are tested. I don't see any mandate who pays for it one way or the other. Moving, um, on. Uh, moving on to section four. This is about the intrastate movement of animals. Again, a few years ago, you changed some of the requirements for livestock management. One of the things that you did is that you required all livestock being transported within the state to satisfy the requirements for uh, official ID under USDA's traceability rule. But it's, it's, there's been some situations where the agency is like, oh, we, you really don't need to comply with that rule, it's like moving, moving animals between your own barns. You know, you might have a farm in Franklin and a farm in Addison and you're moving your animals. So you really need to, to follow all the ID requirements there. Um, and so the secretary asked for the ability by procedure to waive the requirements of subsection A those traceability requirements for certain types or categories of interstate transport of livestock. And so that's what section four would do. It would give the secretary that authority. Should I move on? So that brings you to section five and you can go to page seven. You're at, uh, entering a few different sections, amending the apiary laws in the state. Um, the first is amending the report requirement. Um, the, um, the report is supposed to provide the location of all apiaries and the location of an apiary shall become its registered location. However, the first change is that registered location is only going to be considered its, its location if it meets the other requirements for a location which are in. 6 BSA 3034, which I will get to in a minute. 
And then further down on that page in subdivision three, the term serious is being struck. There's a, a definition of what disease is for um, bees and it, it includes serious. So having serious here is redundant. And so that is being struck. And in addition, page seven at the bottom of the page, if applicable, it's, it's not necessary. Um, it's applicable. Does um, anyone and, else find this minutia oddly comforting? <laughs> uh, yes, I was thinking the same thing. I was like, this feels like the Ag Committee again. <laughs> right. I know how you feel. Um, going on to the next page, there's a notification that uh, the apiary um, owner report the detection of uh, American fowl brood uh, in their hive um, to the secretary as soon as possible, as soon as practicable, as I should say. Um, and then going down section That, that wasn't part of last year's requirements already? Uh, no, it wasn't. It wasn't in there last year. Um, in section six, uh, there's been there was discussion in the house uh, about what standard the laboratory needs to meet for testing whether or not it needs to be a federal laboratory could it be another laboratory could it be a certified laboratory what certification would the laboratory need to have to avoid all of that discussion the house just said it's a laboratory approved by the secretary um, so the secretary can can determine which laboratories it, it feels meets the standards and um, inform the apiary community of that. All right, uh, moving down to section seven. Uh, if a person is um, going to sell their bees, if they're engaged in the rearing of bees for sale, currently they are supposed to um, at least twice during the summer have their uh, apiary inspected. And that, that's just a, um, a burden, administrative burden on the agency. Uh, one of the things that they like to do is to reduce that somewhat. And so instead of it being twice each summer, it's going to be prior to sale at least once each summer. So that will allow the agency to reduce the number of inspections, but it will also be conditioned on before they are sold. So the agency will have that opportunity to, to look at the health of those bees before they are sold. Michael, I, oh, go ahead, Senator Hardy. I don't know, I bet you were gonna ask the same thing I'm gonna ask, which is, I, I seem to remember last year when we did our bee bill that we increased, we, we provided additional resources for the agency to provide to do inspections and that, part of the goal was that they do more inspections. So this seems to be going in the other direction. Well, they they do they did hire someone. I think she's actually full time. I think what, um, and they are doing more inspections because they've hired Brooke. Um, but I think it's still something that they, they believe they can achieve the intent of this. Uh, and ensuring the health of the, the the bees prior to sale while reducing that administrative inspection requirement. I also seem to recall there was a time window. We had to, if you were transporting, you had to have a test within two weeks or something. We're so gonna we, get to that. Okay. So, so that's the next section, section eight. Um, so the agency shall not approve the import of bees, use equipment or colony, colonies from out of state unless accompanied by a valid certificate of inspection within the previous 45 days. <clears throat> Last year you said it at 60 and now the agency is asking for 45. So you can't bring your bees in from another state unless it has a, a certificate of inspection from that state issued in the previous 45 days. And then moving down in B, um, any person other than a common carrier who knowingly transport or causes to be 
transported, used equipment or colonies to a point within the state shall provide the secretary with an approved import permit and certificate of inspection no less than 10 days prior to entry. So current law is you provide that certificate not more than 72 hours after entry. And so the agency wants to go back to the import permit and inspection is provided prior to entry. That's what it used to be prior to entry. And they want to go back to that. And how does one get an approved import permit? You uh, apply to the agency for that. Okay. And they just say, yep, bring them in or do they? Uh, th they have they have an application and you fill it out and you provide the information and they approve or not. Because that is not part of the current law, correct? So you, you did not need an import permit. Um, you just needed a valid a certificate of inspection and, and now you would need an import permit. Okay, thank you. Should I move on? Um, on page 10 at the kind of in the middle, there is an exception to the um, requirement for an import permit or a valid certificate of inspection. Um, and that is, you had that they were the bees are registered in Vermont, or Vermont were transported not more than 75 miles from the registered location and are imported back into the state. Currently, the condition was they are imported back into the state within 90 days of the date of original transport. There is some concern that that may be too long um, and that 30 days is sufficient for them to travel across borders to do their. Um, job of pollinating crops or orchards and then to come back into the state. So that, that was the proposal to move it from 90 to 30. Should I move on? All right, section nine is just that first change of getting rid of serious before bee disease because it's redundant. Section 10 is the criteria for establishing an apiary location. I won't go through all of them, but this is the section that's referenced in your first apiary section about when a location becomes the registered location. The only change here is, is on subdivision four. It was unclear whether all of these conditions were individual or conjunctive. So we added an or, uh, it's all of these are, are individual exceptions that you don't have to qualify all of them, qualify for all of them to be um, accepted. Section 11 is about rabbits and slaughtering them. Rabbits are not an amenable species under the Federal Meat Inspection Act. And the Federal Meat Inspection Act requires states to be equal to, meaning that their requirements need to be the same as the Federal Meat Inspection Act. So rabbits are being removed from the definition of livestock under the slaughter requirements. A person that raises rabbits still can voluntarily get them inspected and rabbits still need to meet the FDA standards for the sale of food, meaning that they can't be adulterated but they are not required to be um, inspected under the Federal Meat Inspection Act and are being removed from that requirement under state law. Section 12 and 13, there are two um, ag water quality funding programs that are not under the ag water quality funding chapter or sub chapter and the agency wants to consolidate all of those funding programs into one chapter, sub chapter. So that's what section 12 does. It takes the Vermont Seeding and Filter Strip Program and the Farm Agronomic Practices Program and takes them from where they are in law under existing sub chapters and moves it to the Ag Water Quality subchapter. It doesn't change the substance of these 
sections at all. Not one word has been changed. They are the same as existing law. They're just being moved. Um, and that allows you to go to section 14. Um, this is just some technical changes to the requirement that the agency adopt RAPs. Um, you're, you're gone by it, Linda. Um, so the agency was required to adopt or amend the, the uh, RAPs to uh, include requirements for a small farm certification, and they were supposed to do that on or before July 1, 2016. They did that they would like to get rid of that date they feel it's been met now the reference to it is obsolete and they would like to be directed to maintain the rules for small farm certification instead of adopt them um, and that's what section 14 would do should i go on Section 15 is about the certification of custom applicators. Custom applicators are people who apply manure or nutrients to the land of others for compensation. And you require them in Act 64 to be certified by the state in order to provide those services. However, you have some exceptions from the requirement to be certified, and those are on page 16. First, the owner or operator of their own farm applying manure or nutrients is not required to be certified custom applicator. That condition from Act 64 was conditioned on the owner or operator completing ag water quality training. Well, ag water quality training is already required. If a farmer hasn't completed their ag water quality training, they're already in violation. Um, so the agency doesn't want to condition this on something that's already a, a requirement. They would like to just keep those two requirements separate. Uh, a farmer that didn't complete their ag water quality training would already be in violation. Um, they don't think it needs to be a condition to the, um, the exception from custom applicator certification. Is, is and then, there, Michael, is there? Other than neatening it up, is there any problem with having it here as well? Um, you know, the, the, the one problem might be kind of a timing thing based on when farmers have to do their training. So you might have a farmer that um, is in good standing, uh, is about to get their training, training gets delayed for whatever reason, and they come out of compliance with the training requirement. But they're, they're in all intention is for them to come into training. Would they then be prohibited from applying manure to their field? That's, that's I think, where the agency is looking and saying, ah, oh, there's some situations where that requirement here could could create a problem. Okay. Let's okay. try to get through halfway and then we'll okay. call it a day. Well, can you move back up to uh, page 16, sub two? This is, this is the neighborly neighbor provision as it's being called. This is adding an exception to the custom applicator certification for application of manure or nutrients by a farm owner or operator on the field of another farm owner or operator when the total annual volume applied is less than 50% of the annual manure or ag waste by volume generated on the farm where the manure is spread. The concept here is you're a farmer, your equipment for spreading breaks down. Can you ask your neighbor to to apply manure on your farm for half a side of beef for for you know a cut of hog um and not have to get the neighbor have to get certified as a custom applicator the agency would like to have that ability of neighbors to provide those services without having to be 
a certified custom applicator. But they want to put some limits on it. It can't be more than 50% of the total annual manure ag waste by volume generated on that farm, provided that the agency may approve the application of more than 50% on a farm by another operator when circumstances require an application of the manure would not pose a significant potential discharge to run off to state water. That's more of an emergency provision. If, if you really need that neighbor to go in there and deal with it, um, the agency has that authority to do it if it's not going to cre create a threat to water quality. All right, moving on, section 16. This is about the management of non sewage waste. Up until recently, I, the agency. I, I'm, gonna, I, I'm just going to jump in. This seems like uh, we've had beginnings of this kinds of discussion. This is not simple uh, change of word here and there. So I don't think we should do it since we're running over our noon deadline and we all have to be on the floor in less than an hour. Okay. If anybody feels strongly that we should just call it there? Yeah. That sounds yeah. good. Are we meeting tomorrow? I can't remember. No, uh, no, I think we're meeting. Linda, what time are we meeting Friday? It has been at 10 o'clock. Is that what you want again? Well, sure. I think so. The chair will be back in action so you can check with him, but I hope. And our floor Friday is 1130, right? Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. Um, yeah. I think you have to ask Bobby, um, yeah. but it would make sense to me to be a little earlier. Um, Okay, we can stop. I do have a scheduling question, but we can stop the live feed unless anybody has any questions for Mike.